Well, good morning and welcome to worship here at Calvary Memorial United Church. This is the last Sunday of the month. Hard to believe how fast the month has rolled by. It is the fourth Sunday after Epiphany. And as we gather here, we acknowledge that for thousands of years, indigenous people have walked on this land. We are gathered on the traditional land of the Ashnabi and the Mississauga of the New Credit and the Attawandarok nations and acknowledge their stewardship of the land throughout the years. And we acknowledge with respect the history, the culture, and spirituality of the people with whom Treaty 3 was signed. And we are grateful for the care that they took. We are fast making our way through the new year and indeed we still find ourselves worshiping online we pray that soon we will be able to be back in worship together here in our sanctuary Lent does start a little later this year at this beginning of march and our hope our fervent hope is that we'll be back worshiping by then together so that we can work towards celebrating our Easter season. But until then, we thank you for tuning in and being part of our worship experience. We feel blessed and honored to be able to be with you in all sorts of ways as our church. So thank you for your support. As we continue with our worship today, the days are slowly getting longer. The light is increasing, but yet there are still difficult moments in our lives, especially through this pandemic. And so, as always, guiding us through the most difficult and darkest of moments, but also in the joys that we find as the light shines in, we have the light of Christ. So let us now light our Christ candle. And on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide. And on this path, the, the gates of holiness are open wide. And on this path, the gates of holiness are open wide, open wide. Open wide, open wide, the gates are open wide. So enter in, the gates of holiness are open wide. So enter in, the gates of holiness are open wide. So enter in. The gates of holiness are open wide, open wide, open wide, open wide. The gates are open wide. We trust that as you join us in worship, you are able to follow along in a bulletin as posted on our website. And we hope that you have hymn books with you too. If not, you can always come by and We can make sure you have a hymn book to have with you. But let us join in our call to worship as it is printed in our bulletin. It is responsive. So please respond as you are able. Give thanks to God. We thank God for joy, for laughter, for abundant blessings of every kind. Give thanks to God at all times and for everything. We thank God when we can and as we can for struggles, for solitude, for fears. Give thanks to God at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And We thank God that in Christ our joys as well as our pain, our losses as well as our laughter are in God's heart and hand. And let us pray. God of gods, we come to worship you today to hear your good news, to hear of faith, hope, and love ringing out from your kingdom. 
We know that doubt and fear can shake even the strongest. Shape us into faithful, hopeful people. Fill us with your love that passes all understanding. We pray this together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And our opening hymn is found in Voices United at 624, Give to Us Laughter. Give to us laughter, O source of our life. Laughter can banish so much of our strife. Laughter and love give us wholeness and health. Laughter and love are the coin of true wealth. Give to us laughter, a sign of deep joy. Let us in laughing find Christian employ, joining with stars and with bright northern lights, laughing and praising and sharing delights. Why do we worry that we will lose faith? Why act like king for the whole human race? Often in family and often with friend, laughing at pride causes anguish to end. Even in sorrow and hours of grief, laughter with tears bring most healing relief. God give us laughter and God give us peace. Joys of your presence among us increase. Our first scripture on this day comes to us from our Hebrew scriptures from Jeremiah in the first chapter, verses 4 through to 10. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid. Of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Amen. We have many forms of prayer within our worship time. We've had our opening prayer of approach. We will have prayers for the family of God, but we also take time in our services from time to time to do some self-examination through a prayer of confession, but then having some words of assurance too. So let us now join in a prayer for our faith community as we join in prayer responsibly. The community of faith welcomes newcomers and makes them feel at home. And where our welcome is half-hearted or superficial, O oh God, forgive us. The community of faith is sensitive to the youngest, sustains in times of hectic parenthood, and is there in the challenging later years. And when our care is unfeeling or ignores the vulnerable, O oh God, forgive us. The community of faith searches out the talents of members old and new. And where we refuse to try out new skills, where we ignore offers to help or to take responsibility, O oh God, forgive us. The community of faith looks beyond its own fellowship to the wider church and to the downtrodden of other nations where our service is short-sighted and our giving limited to the needs of our own fellowship 
O God, forgive us. The community of faith is not afraid to disclose new truth about the gospel or listen to today's prophets. And where we cling to well-worn ways of interpreting scripture and close our ears to new words of justice, mercy, and peace, O oh God, forgive us. And let us each ponder wherever we find ourselves on these days. Let us ponder these words in silence. Well, you are at the heart of our faith, O oh God. You will open our eyes to realities we would rather avoid. You will enable us to hear the words we would rather not hear. You will give us the strength to follow the path which leads to new and untried ways. Pardon and peace do not come without struggle and reflection, but God will grant you a new heart and a new start. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our next hymn once again comes to us from Voices United, this time found at 272. 272. Open your ears, O faithful people. gospel lesson for today is found in Luke in the fourth chapter, verses 21 through to 30. And then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have already heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there are many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months. And there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them had cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, 
and led him to the brow of the hill in which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. And may God's blessings be upon these readings and to God's holy name, the glory and the praise. Amen. On behalf of everyone watching, thank you again to our complete music team here and our tech team for all the work they do to make these services so special. Well, let us pray. Well, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The first scripture that we heard today is the call of Jeremiah the prophet. Back at Queen's Theological College, I took a religion course in the prophets of the Old Testament. And of all the prophets, Jeremiah is truly one of the greats. In that course on the prophets, well, we study the words of the prophets, their stirring, inspired pronouncements. A prophet like Isaiah or Jeremiah is truly a great poetic writer at any age. We study the probable context in which the prophets worked. That great century of the golden age of prophecy in Israel. We also examine prophetic theology, their ideas about God and the great theological ideas that moved them. And one thing that much impressed me in the course on the prophets was that we know next to nothing <clears throat> about where the prophets came from or what they were doing before they were prophets. Jeremiah says that he was a youth when he became a prophet. But we hardly know anything about Jeremiah's family of origin. We know Amos was a farmer, but that's about all. 
So our textbook on the prophets, when it talked about the origin of the prophets or their backgrounds, well, it resorted to speculation, attempting to surmise the prophets' origins through implications from their writings. Firstly, I enjoy reading biographies. It's fun to learn about what makes famous people tick. And all biographies start in much the same way with their infancy and childhood. A number of biographies actually that I have read be actually begin a century before the birth of the subject of that biography, discussing the person's ancestors and family background. Now most of us think that it's absurd to try and understand anybody without understanding the person's past, the family of origin and the historical antecedents. So that makes it all the more strange that when we come to a prophet like Jeremiah, we are given next to nothing about where he came from, who his family was, or any of the background information that we think is so important. It's as if the prophet came from out of nowhere. It's as if all the prophet's family background, childhood and youth is irrelevant to understanding who the prophet is. The very first verses from the book of Jeremiah that we have just read give us a clue to understanding why we know nothing about Jeremiah before God called him to a prophet. I think that clue is in the words, and the words of the Lord came to Jeremiah. It is the word of the Lord, the call of God, coming to this young man, that Jeremiah, that gets going the story of him. There is a sense in which there is no Jeremiah to know before God called Jeremiah. That Jeremiah's family background, his own youthful aspirations and inclinations, none of that made Jeremiah a prophet. As today's scripture shows, Jeremiah did not want to be a prophet. Call someone else, he protested. But God called Jeremiah. The idea of Jeremiah being a spokesperson for God was God's idea before it was Jeremiah's. But isn't it always that way between God and us? Maybe you're not called to be a prophet, but we believe that all of us here are called to be something. Called to be somebody we would not have been without God's call upon our lives. Your being a Christian, a disciple of Jesus Christ, was God's idea before it was yours. And I think that's really important. It means that the life you are living is not necessarily your own. It means that your relationship to God is not dependent upon you having the right family background, a good history, a yearning for God, or any natural inclinations that keep you near God. It means that your relationship with God is based solely upon God and for us through Jesus Christ. Jeremiah resisted the call of God. But in doing so, he understood that to be summoned by God is not necessarily to be called to that which would make our lives easier and more fulfilling. It is to be called to participate in God's work in the world. And Jeremiah often was put in great danger and such misery because he'd been called by God to speak God's truth. Peter's story warns contemporary Christians that giving our hearts to Christ often puts us in peril being placed by Jesus with people with whom we might not have, if left our own devices, have chosen on our own. People are often persuaded to ask Jesus into their hearts, but when they do, Jesus asks, hey, can I bring my friends, the poor, the despised, the hungry, the dirty, the powerless? And people often respond, well, Jesus, is it really only you that we wanted, we think? Jesus replied, though, love me, love my friends. But to be loved by Christ can sure be a challenge. The most controverted, intensive, and challenging thing about salvation in Jesus Christ is that that salvation is in Jesus Christ. Our vocation is not first of all what we want. Our vocation is not our answer to a summons to be part of what God's want. If there is no other name by which we may be saved, as it says in Acts, then those of us 
who know Jesus ought to understand better than anyone why many resist this rescue. I enjoy watching all sorts of movies. So I was writing this sermon, I was thinking of one movie from a while ago called Crash. It discusses, or it opens with actually a disgusting scene where an African-American couple is stopped by two Caucasian police officers. One of the policemen, obviously a troubled middle-aged man, humiliates the couple by touching and probing the woman on the pretense that he's doing a search looking for weapons. It's a humiliating example of racism and sexist evil. And the couple in the movie is enraged, with the, or enraged, but they feel helpless to do anything about it. Eventually, they separate. And so angry is the woman that her husband stood by and did nothing. So humiliated and angry is the man that he was a helpless bystander as his beloved was humiliated by this racist cop. It took that much toll on them. Now later in the same movie, that same policeman comes upon a terrible accident. The car is flipped upside down, it's leaking gas. Trapped inside the driver, the policeman moves into action, crawling inside the car. But when he climbs inside and the trapped driver sees him, she begins screaming, no, no, not you. Get away from me, don't touch me. It's the same woman who he had earlier humiliated. She's obviously terrified to see him. Though she hangs upside down, though gasoline is leaking all around her, she can't stand the thought of being near this man again, much less having him save her. But the policeman acts as he's been trained. He attempts to calm her. He tells her she's going to make it. He pulls out his knife, cuts her free, gently letting her down, upside down in that car and turning her up, eventually pulling her to safety just before that car explodes into flames. As she is led by, away by others, she looks over her shoulder and sees the cop, the man who had so terribly wronged her, as now the one responsible for her life. She must live as one who is being saved, indebted to a man whom she hates. Her savior, quote unquote, is the perpetrator of a terrible, sinful act. It's all very complicated for her. But extrapolating on this salvation is complicated because of the God who saves. We are saved and summoned by the one we despise. Unlike the movie, we are saved not by the one who abused us, by the one who was abused. The one we crucified becomes our savior. And in being saved, we are also indebted, enlisted, bound in discipleship to the one who saved us. Our salvation in Christ thus presses upon us a heavy responsibility to live with Christ. His salvation makes our lives more complex than if we had not been reached to and embraced by him. In Surprise by Joy, C.S. Lewis describes his conversion to a full, robust, believing in the Christian faith person. Lewis's own experience of conversion from Atheism, where he started to orthodoxy, is in Lewis's telling mostly a story about how God came to him rather than about how Lewis came to God. The story of his discovering that, in his words, all my waitings and watchings for joy had been a futile attempt to contemplate the enjoyed. It's well known to many generations of Christians. The odd thing was that before God closed in on me, he said I was in fact offering what now appears a moment of holy free choice. I was going up Headington Hill on the top of a bus without words, and I think almost without images. A fact about myself was somehow presented to me. I became aware that I was holding something at bay or shutting something out. I love the way that he put his conversion. God closed in on me. Then Lewis describes his own desperate attempts to get away from the God who was steadily closing in on him. He describes his escape attempts in very much the same way that Jeremiah describes his, please God, close in on somebody else, not me. You need to use your imaginations, but you must picture him alone in that room and Magdalene, night after night, 
feeling whenever my mind lifted for even a second from my work that steady, unrelenting approach of him who I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. And in the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in. And I admitted that God was God, and I knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. Well, I suspect there are those among us who are watching today who can sympathize with C.S. Lewis being the most and his worst dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. And you can fully understand why Jeremiah attempted to beg off his prophetic vocation. Their stories are not stories of people looking out for a more meaningful life and somehow found God. Their stories are of reluctant, half-hearted inductees who are summoned by God for tasks that were God's ideas before they were there. John Howard Yoder writes, The work of God is the calling of a people, whether in the Old Covenant or the New. And that men and women are called together to a new wholeness in itself is the work of God which gives meaning to history. Our God not only loves us, but summons us. We're summoned for divine service not because of who we are, but because of who God is. God in Jesus Christ calls ordinary people to do extraordinary work for God. In your life and mine, our stories with God always begin with, and the word of the Lord came to. Amen. Our next in this morning, found in Voices United at 556, would you bless our homes and families? Undemanding, let us use the time that's ours to delight in simple pleasures, sharing joys in gentle hours. When our way is anxious walking and a heavy path we plot, teach us trust in one another and in you our gracious God. From the homes in which we're nurtured with the love that shapes us there teach us God to claim us family everyone whose life we share and through all that life may Let us reach beyond the boundaries of our daily thought and care till the family you have chosen spills its love out everywhere. Help us learn to love each other with a love that constant stays. Teach us when we face our troubles, love's expressed in many ways. When we would be gathered here, we would be passing the offering plate. It seems like such a long time ago that we shared in that communal response to God, the way that we are called to give not only of ourselves, but of our gifts. But yet we still do present our offerings in assorted ways. And it is so 
so important to recognize and honor all that you do to keep Calvary Memorial a delight to this neighborhood and beyond. So let us now dedicate those offerings that you were presented by hearing verse 5. There's a spirit in the air. Calvin's voice for tonight is at 582, and then we will have a responsive offering prayer. A stranger's not alone where the homeless find a home. Praise the love that Christ revealed, living King in our, our world. And now let us join in response to prayer. These gifts faithfully proclaim our commitment. They provide companionship to the lonely, comfort to the sick, justice to the oppressed, and hope to those who have suffered loss. Bless them as token of all we can give and be in Christ. Amen. We do have so many types of prayers. We each take time to offer them in various ways through our daily lives. We always reach a point now in our service as we think of all those who are on our hearts and in our minds as we pray for the family of God, for our own families, for our church community, and for those in our world. So now let us just pause for a moment of silence as we think of all those who are in our hearts and on our minds on this day. O gracious and loving God, you who have called us out of nothingness to the significance of co-workers with you in building a world where your love can become the atmosphere of human existence, we are thankful for such a task to fill our lives with meaning and purpose. And our lives take on a new stature against the backdrop of history and the universe when seen in the light of your mission for us. But we are also thankful for the times when we can return from our tasks, come back again from being sent forth to share the insights we have gained with others who have been touched with the vision of your love. Because here we can dream again the great dreams that have beckoned your people throughout the ages. Dreams of a society where love walks the streets, where caring hearts reach out through ready hands to restore the broken and the lost, to bring new hope where despair has taken root. And here we can share resources and ideas, the instruments for effective action that will bring those dreams to reality. Gather us in again and again that our going forth may be done with vision constantly renewed and with your spirit ever fresh and alive within us. In the name of Jesus, your anointed one, who taught us to sing together. Not into ways of temptation. 
And our closing hymn this day comes to us from more voices, found at 136, 136, when hands reach out. the silent songs we bring. When broken bodies will not bend, we thank you, God, for Christ our friend. In him our healing can begin. He welcomes all the wounded in. And when the ways we learn and grow are not the ways that others know. We thank you, God, that we have learned your love's a gift and never We will seek out new friends. We will strengthen the faith community. And the grace of Jesus Christ, who teaches, saves, and sustains, will go with you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Let us now hear our choral closing. in faith. 